This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Hello, welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour. I'm Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission, and this is the Arts Commission's weekly turn at the microphone here at MPB. Each week we come to you at this time with a different uh, long-form interview with a different creative Mississippian. We talk to artists, visual artists, musicians, writers, and as well as people who help uh, bring the creative arts to their community in Mississippi. Today we're going to be talking about writing. We're going to be talking about the great city of Natchez with our return guest, Richard Grant. Richard, welcome. Hey, Larry. Good to be here. Thanks so much for coming back. Uh, Of course, you were on the show a few years back with your last book, uh, Dispatches from Pluto, which a lot of folks remember. Uh, It was kind of your uh, recount of your time in the Delta, living up in that remote community uh, in Pluto. But you've come back today with a brand new book about a different part of Mississippi. Uh, Tell us just a little bit about it to start off. Well, yeah, I mean, I... I was living in the Delta. I really didn't know anything about Natchez. And um, I met a cook called Regina Charbonneau, a cookbook writer and a chef. And she said, uh, why don't you come and stay with me in Natchez? I live in an antebellum home. You can do a book signing in my restaurant, King's Tavern, which is from the 1790s. And, um, and I'll take you to a party. I said, great, that sounds wonderful. So I showed up in Natchez, really knowing nothing about the place, and uh, I just became really intrigued. I found out, it, just driving in, I, I stumbled upon the um, the site of what had been the second largest slave market in the Deep South. And then I learned uh, that Natchez had elected a gay black man as mayor with 91% of the vote, and this seemed this seemed unusual and interesting. And then I ended up, and ended up at Stanton Hall, which is an antebellum mansion that occupies an entire city block at this garden club um, social function. And um, I just became really intrigued and started going back and staying with Regina and found out that there was two garden clubs that have been feuding since 1935 and became interested in the history and the, and the culture of Natchez. And yeah, I found it hard to stay away after a while. So the book is called The Deepest South of All True Stories from Natchez, Mississippi. It's just come out, I guess, in the last week or so. Um, right. What has been the response so far? Um, it's mainly positive, actually. Um, I think it's caused a bit of some drama in in Natchez, but I'm getting sort of secondhand reports of that. But I've been, it's it's a little hard to tell when you just sit at your desk at home. Normally I would be going to events and meeting people and hearing what they think of it. So I I sort of have to judge a little bit by social media, but I've been getting a lot of compliments on social media and um, been getting good reviews. Good. It's just strange doing this in 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 the year of covid you know right right such as a book about such a social place in a in a a forced non-social time exactly yeah Um, i was was supposed to have a big launch at the mississippi book festival i was really looking forward to but you know reality uh intervened in the form of the virus yes yes so um Dispatches from Pluto was a really well-received book in state, especially here. There, uh, tons of people were reading it and ta- reading it and talking about it. Were you uh, kind of during that in you know in the tour phase and people doing the readings in that? Were you having people from other parts of Mississippi say, you know, you really got to come to my town or my town? You know, I, I there's tons of stories there. Were you kind of getting pitches? Uh, I was getting pitches, and I had this. What I wanted to do was was kind of write a sequel to Dispatches from Pluto, where it, in which I would travel around the whole state and um, sort of record encounters and impressions. And I had, you know, had a lot of stuff kind of accumulating in my notebooks from, you know, going to the Neshoba County Fair, from going to the coast, uh, from going alligator hunting. Uh, but my publisher aggressively rejected the idea of a of a sequel, saying that sequels don't sell. And um, but I was able to persuade them to let me write write this book about Natchez. So you in in our intro, you talked a little bit of kind of your introduction. How soon was it after you know going down to visit Regina and her friends that you started 
thinking, well, this might be a book here. It, it was a matter of hours. It was that, <laughs> it was that first afternoon and evening. I, I stayed awake all that night. I was kind of, my brain was churning with ideas. Like, what is this place? And how did it get this way? And, you know, the whole town, in, in a way, you know, we've got this discussion going on now about, about, what to do about Confederate monuments and monuments commemorating slaveholders. And, you know, Natchez, I mean, the whole town is kind of like a monument to slavery. It was all built on enslaved labor and, and, and the sale and purchase of human beings. As, as was explained to me by um, a local activist, what do you do when your whole town is kind of like a monument to, to slavery? Yeah. Oh. So I thought that was an interesting um you know question to explore there's just a there's just a lot there um it's a it just struck me as a unique american place uh, the civil, How are you? Civil go rights ahead was was interesting too I, I interviewed a member of there was a group called the deacons for defense in natchez and they rejected in the 1960s the Martin Luther King model of nonviolent protest, they took up guns and basically backed down the Klan with, with firearms and succeeded. And the city ended up between that and a boycott of all the white owned stores downtown. The, the city agreed to pretty much all of their demands. It was, it was the use of, it was the use of, of arms and guns in, in the civil rights era. So again, that Natchez seemed interesting that way. Because it had been a terrible place for clan violence, the worst clan violence in America, place and in Natchez and across the river there. Right, it, Natchez is. It, it kind of reminds me of, of you know a European city in that you have so many layers of history. You know, you go to Italy and they talk about you know the Roman era, the 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 uh, you know the Renaissance. It's like layer upon layer, and Natchez is kind of unique in Mississippi to have those kind of multiple tiers of its history. Right. I mean, they, you had the Spanish and the French and the English and the Native American. Yeah, there's a lot of, there are a lot of layers there. You're listening to the Arts Hour. I'm Larry Morrissey. And our guest today is Richard Grant. And we're talking about his brand new book, The Deepest South of All, True Stories from Natchez, Mississippi. So I was curious about kind of your, in, your initial, um, uh, reception in Natchez. Uh, Natchez is, you know, it's it's a very um, isolated city in, in Mississippi, but it's also kind of like been receiving outsiders for many years. I mean, they built kind of their part of their economy is on is on um, is on tourism. So just curious about kind of, you know, when they found out you're a writer and you're you're talking to them and that kind of stuff, what was what was kind of the response to your your project? Um, I mean, there were there were people who were incredibly welcoming to me. Um, I mean, largely because uh, a lot of people had read Dispatches from Pluto in Natchez and had liked it. So I, I didn't really have much trouble getting getting access to people. And um, I think I'm not sure it goes for everybody, but a lot of people were enthusiastic about the idea that I, I might write a book about Natchez and it might ultimately bring people to Natchez. Um, yeah, incredible hospitality. I basically, Regina gave me the the top rooms of her antebellum home for whenever I wanted it, and she would tell people, "We keep an Englishman in the attic." And uh, yeah, no, I, I found that I was just overwhelmed by the hospitality there. Natchez is very good at that. Yeah, the thing that I keeps coming back to me is kind of how they are. You know, they unlike a lot of you know, like the Delta. It has really started to work on their tourism kind of angle of their, you know, presentation, maybe in the last 15, maybe 20 at the most years, you know, trying to bring tourists where Natchez has this history of, you know, you know, bringing people in and trying to bring the outsider in since the early 1930s. And just and how different I, I wonder about that in terms of other books you've written and kind of like how that tourism aspect may be affects the culture and, and and how they present themselves to outsiders 
I mean, what 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 the what the town was really grappling with when when I was there and has been grappling with, you know, the traditional model of tourism there was basically Natchez, where the old South lives, was the was the slogan, and it presented this kind of uh, romantic, gone with the wind version of the old South to tourists. And that was a very successful model for a long time, uh, but it totally omitted the. African American history and slavery from the from the town's history. So in in recent years, um, you know, Natchez has been working out ways that its African American history can be included in the tourism experience without kind of putting people off too much. So that was that was one of the big things sort of going on. How do we how do we make the history more inclusive? Um, how do we introduce the history of slavery into our celebrations of our past? There was a, there was a lot of talk about this in a lot of different areas of Natchez society. You know, one example was they had this uh, this tableau, which is a series of sort of theatrical skits that addresses Natchez history, and traditionally it's just been about white history. But Greg Isles had. Um, had introduced tableau that addressed slavery and the and uh, that was sort of continuing while I was there. How do you how do you present slavery in a, in a theatrical production that also features children dancing around a maypole? It's a kind of a, a difficult fit. Right, right. And um, and, and a thing that you kind of interweave, you know, you have the the kind of the showing kind of contemporary Natchez and talking to the different members of the community, but you interweave that with kind of a historic, we're not a kind of a historical narrative about a, a former slave who, who was brought to Natchez in the antebellum era. And I was curious about kind of uh, um, your thoughts about kind of interweaving that story and, and it, it does, it brings in that kind of the, the cycle of, of, of history in that and, and how it connects to everything. But I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that element of the book. Yeah. So when I when I started getting interested in Natchez, I, I spoke to my friend Alan Huffman, the, the writer. I said, what is it? What, what's the best book to read about Natchez? And he said, oh, the best book about Natchez that I know is Prince Among Slaves by Terry Alford, which is the biography of this West African prince called Abdel Rahman Ibrahima, who um, he was a very educated man. He'd been to university in Timbuktu. He spoke five or six languages. He knew a lot about astronomy. Um, and he lost a battle in what is now Guinea, West Africa, and was captured. And he ended up being enslaved in Natchez, Mississippi. And uh, he was enslaved there for 40 years. And then it was found out that his that he really was a, a West African prince. And then he went on a fundraising tour. He wound up going to the White House, meeting uh, President John Quincy Adams, and then he ended up going back to Africa. And it's an amazing story. And I was looking for something that, um, some way of dealing with the, with the history of, of slavery in Natchez. And his was really the only account of a, enslaved person in Natchez that, that we know in any detail. Um, so I decided to weave this story through the book. Um, yeah, I just, I just couldn't get the story out of my mind once I heard it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, it's, it's its own page turner and kind of yeah. keeps, keeps then, going throughout the, throughout the book. When I started meeting his descendants in, in Natchez, it seemed to just kind of, um, you realize how that story continues to ripple into the present. This is Larry Morrissey. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show is broadcast on MPB statewide radio network on Sundays at 5 p.m. For access to all our past shows, please subscribe to the Arts Hour on your favorite podcasting app. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. 
If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB. I'm Larry Morrissey, and our guest today is Richard Grant, and we're talking about his latest book, just came out, The Deepest South of All, True Stories from Natchez, Mississippi. So, Richard, one of the kind of the central, um, I guess, conflicts in the book that's in the community that you that you document is the kind of the the, the war between the two garden clubs in Natchez. And when a lot of people, there's garden clubs in, you know, towns all across Mississippi and I'm sure across the deep South, but the garden club as an entity in Natchez kind of has its totally own um, uh, traditions and, and importance in the community. Yeah. Well, one thing I learned was that they don't, they don't really do much gardening. Um, what they, <laughs> what they do is that they run a lot of the tourism um, involves the antebellum homes and they also do a lot of uh, restoration of historic buildings and yeah gardening really isn't sort of on their agenda that much although they they do like flowers um, so what happened was in the 1930s uh, a garden club woman named Catherine Miller in Natchez kind of inaugurated this tradition of, of, of running tourists, bringing tourists into the antebellum homes and um, talking about family history and showing them family heirlooms. And this became the Natchez pilgrimage. And then sometime in the 1930s, the, 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 it, there was at that time one Natchez garden club and it turned into two factions that had a squabble about money. And then uh, there was a split called the War of the Hoop Skirts, or remembered as the War of the Hoop Skirts. And um, then you had the Pilgrimage Garden Club and the Natchez Garden Club, and they have been sort of feuding on and off ever since. And uh, the feud kind of flared up again while I was there. And uh, it seemed to, you know, Amongst that segment of Natchez society, um, garden clubs are very important. You, you note multiple times that, uh, the, and, and your the, the people of Nat, a lot of the garden clubs member talk about Natchez as a matriarchy, and and a lot of the scenes in the book, the men are kind of kind of at the periphery of the scene, and the and the the women are at the center of it. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that the, the town as a whole is that matriarchal, but in in the in the garden club sort of high society, yeah, I was I was struck by how matriarchal it was, and how, I remember sort of asking a woman, you know, what well, does she have a husband? And um, it was like I was asking something irrelevant. She was, oh, I think he might be dead. It was the <laughs> women run the show in, in in that in that social set. And, yeah, there's, and, there's, a yeah. lot of, there's a lot of women and, and gay men in this book. Not 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 so many straight white guys. They make a rip roaring appearance near the end, but yeah, they're by and large uh, yeah. kind of. Um, but one of the scene, one of the kind of the scenes of that is also just that kind of the pecking order within the garden clubs and the kind of the the the, the elderly dames of of these clubs kind of being the. Um, almost like the uh, the younger ones coming coming ha and having to kind of almost pay pay tribute to them you know at the at the social functions yeah, so the, the first the first night I spent in Natchez uh, Regina Charbonneau took me to this this ball at, at Stanton Hall and I was really struck by the uh, the poise and grace and power of the elderly women there these women in their sort of 70s and 80s were the senior figures in, in the pilgrimage garden club. And at a certain point at the party, they, they lined up, they sat down on these antique chairs in the, in the dining room, and these younger women would come up and pay court to them. But since the older women were sitting on chairs, the younger women had to kind of crouch down awkwardly or kneel. 
and kind of uh, kind of almost abase themselves to, mm. to so they wouldn't be above their social superiors in a, in a physical sense. And yeah, it was one of the it was one of the things I found intriguing was was the the relationship between the younger women and the and the older women with power there. Yeah, and then the, so the kind of the drama of the book in terms of the garden clubs is all around, you know, in the contemporary account is all about a lot of it is about this the tableau that you mentioned earlier, and it was interesting you tracking kind of the. The, the attempts to try to modernize the tableau, of course, it kind of going back to this being this thing for, you know, a show for outsiders who were coming in for the pilgrimage, but then has kind of transformed into this very um, important community event. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the tableau, which used to be called the Confederate pageant, I think it was, um, yeah, it started out as something to entertain the um, the tourists that came for pilgrimage. But then it's, it's a very complicated thing. It became woven into the social life of the town. Um, so women who volunteer, who do a lot of volunteer work for the garden club, one of their rewards is that their children get plum rolls in the tableau. And it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, the... Very few visitors actually go to the thing a, a, anymore. It, it's but it's where kind of Natchez reveals a lot of its. Uh, uh, Natchez kind of works out a lot of its issues through the tableau, um, and it's also been been a source of conflict over the years because it requires the two garden clubs to work together on the production, and there have been instances of one garden club sabotaging the other. Um, it's very, it gets very fraught because you're, you're dealing with children, you're dealing with dogs. They have real live hound dogs for one scene, beagle. So it's children, it's dogs, it's warring garden clubs, it's amateur theatrical, uh, drama. And most outsiders who witness the production just sort of walk away slightly baffled. Like what, 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 what's the point of this? Somebody described it as um, like springtime for Hitler, only with Confederates. <laughs> because the, the, the young men dress up in Confederate generals' uniforms and the, the, the young women are wearing hoop skirts. And it's, a, it's, it's pretty extraordinary that it still survives, frankly, in, in the 21st century. Yeah, and then uh, Greg Isles, who you speak to, uh, the writer Greg Isles from Natchez, kind of, I guess, prior to your arrival, had kind of made an attempt to re rewrite and kind of bring the African American experience into the into the show a little bit. Yeah, well, actually, a lot. I mean, he okay, he had um, he had African American performers for the first time. He 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 addressed slavery head on for the first time. Um, he had a lot of, uh, he incorporated a lot of African-American history into the production for the first time. And for the first year that he did it, um, it was, it was seemed to be, um, I mean, I wasn't there, but judging from what people said, that uh, it, w it seemed like a very meaningful thing for the town. And um, although was opposed by the uh, more conservative white people in the town, um, but the, I guess the next year, the, the, the atmosphere was not so good, and some of the some of the African American performers were treated badly. And I think, um, yeah, I think I think a Greg had given enough of his time for free to the thing, and I think b he got kind of disheartened by the the way that the Af some of the African American performers were treated. And then, so when I was there, another another woman had taken over the production, but she was also very eager to include as much African American history as possible. But it's just, you know, the existing tableau. It has, you know, it has these scenes of children dancing around the maypole in pretty dresses, and it has the the king and queen of the garden club being presented in in Confederate uniforms and hoop skirts and gowns and tiaras, and it's. It's just very difficult to portray slavery next to that in a way that isn't jarring. Right. And all those scenes are the scenes that are important to the Garden Club members in terms of 
it's kind of the star time for their children and right. other relatives. Yeah, exactly. Now that when if your if your child is is king or queen of the of the garden club or king or queen of pilgrimage, it's 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 a very proud moment for the for the mothers in particular. You're listening to the Arts Hour. I'm Larry Morrissey, and our guest today is Richard Grant, and we're talking about his new book, The Deepest South of All: True Stories from Natchez, Mississippi. I was um, I was wondering, working at the Arts Commission, we you know we get to know a lot of people in the communities, and Natchez knows no exception. So I was very eager to see the, wait for this gentleman's arrival in the book, and it didn't take him long. But uh, probably one of the most distinctive personalities. Uh, in the contemporary part of the book was uh, Sir Boxley, the the activist, African American activist from Natchez. Yeah, yeah, I spent I spent quite a bit of time with with Sir Boxley. Uh, interesting guy. Um, yeah, he was uh, he was largely responsible for getting the Forks of the Road, which was the uh, second largest slave market in the in the Old South. To, to, to be commemorated. He, he, he fought like a lion for that. And um, he's also, you know, there's, there's a lot of eccentrics in, in Natchez and he also has some eccentric tendencies. He, uh, he in, in his own way, he also likes to dress up in, uh, in uniforms and impersonate the dead. He dresses up like a United States colored troops uh, dresses up in their uniforms and holds historical reenactments. He's, I think he has gate crashed um, other Civil War reenactments with his own troop of reenactors. And he also, you sometimes you see him wearing kind of African clothing. I think he spent a lot of time in Africa and was going to was going to move to Africa when he felt the calling to kind of um, honor his ancestors who were bought and sold at the Forks of the Road. And that's been that was his First Crusade, and then he wanted to get the, you know, the the role of the United States Colored Troops during the Civil War. He wanted to get that recognized, and uh, yeah, he's a he he cuts a he cuts a large figure in matches. I did like the the fact you know his his uh, his personality is acknowledged. You know, he's not the easiest person to he's not a he's not a get along type person. But I, I was very it, it was very happy to see, especially like I think it was the superintendent from the Park Service, you know, really acknowledged his um, his contributions and moving things forward in terms of those recognitions. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think Sir Boxley would not would not claim to be a get along person. He's a, yeah. he's a he's a battler, but he has really he has really made a difference in that town as as far as getting African American history recognized and, and it's pretty much included in all the tourism experiences now even in the even the pilgrimage the garden club pilgrimage in its brochure um lists the forks of the road slave market as a must-see site that's amazing that's amazing and it, i don't think it would have happened if it hadn't been for for sir boxley you mentioned the uh the deacons of defense earlier and it, it sounds like it, in the book, it was it was not they are, you know, still uh, members of this group who who, you know, protected the African-American community, you know, armed themselves during the civil rights era. They're still around, but they weren't the they they, they keep a low profile and it doesn't seem like they necessarily want, uh, you know, to talk about it, you know, in the in the broader sense. So tell me about kind of that, you know, that project of kind of getting getting the confidence of the the gentleman that you interviewed. So yeah, the, when the when the deacons for defense formed, they all took a vow of silence um, to to not reveal anything about the organization. Um, you know, especially not to white men. Um, but you know, a lot of time has now passed, and I kind of I went to a. There's a local um, newspaper man, African American newspaper man. I approached him, and I approached some people at the African American Catholic Church, saying I would be interested in meeting and interviewing any surviving members of the Deacons for Defense. And 
Yeah, one man, James Stokes, who had been one of the organisers, uh, agreed to agreed to talk to me, uh, which was I felt very honoured to to meet him. And yeah, it was just um, they're they're good Mississippians, you know. They 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 saw the value of firearms in the civil rights struggle. A lot of them had been former. Um, soldiers during World War II, so they, they knew weapons, they knew how to hunt. And what the, one of the real um, kind of bulwarks of white supremacy at that time was the Klan, you know, the, the Klan had everyone terrified for good reason. They were, they were whipping and burning and murdering people with impunity. They completely infiltrated the law enforcement in that, in that part of Mississippi and Louisiana. And the the deacons recognized that the Klan basically had a bully mentality and that if you stood up to them with guns, um, well, as they proved, the Klan basically backed off and there was no more violence in the black community in Natchez after the deacons formed. This is Larry Morrissey. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show is broadcast on MPB's statewide radio network on Sundays at 5 p.m. For access to all our past shows, please subscribe to the Arts Hour on your favorite podcasting app. If you ever miss one of our locally produced shows or want to simply hear it again, you can find what you need at mpbonline.org or download our podcast app to your smartphone. MPB programming is on your schedule at mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Arts Hour on MPB. I'm Larry Morrissey, and today our guest is Richard Grant, and we've been talking about his new book, The Deepest South of All, True Stories from Natchez, Mississippi, just came out. Um, so, Richard, you, you, we talked a little bit about the prince, uh, the former slave, in, in the earlier segment, but talk to me about, tell me about kind of your, um, th- there's so much history in Natchez and, and a lot of, and you, and you, you notate a lot of it throughout the book, what was your kind of research for this, uh, for this book? Uh, my research, I mean, basically in, in, involved, you know, reading as much as I could find. Um, there's, there's been, there's been a few good books written about Nets. I'm just looking at my bookshelf here. I've got probably, uh, 20, 20 books about Natchez sitting on the shelf. I also read a lot of books about, um, about American slavery and also global slavery, just to, to see how the American version of it uh, turns out to be quite unusual compared to other forms of slavery around the world in human history. So I wanted to I wanted to kind of get a handle on all of that, um, and then you know most of it you, you, I didn't end up using, but I just wanted I wanted to have some sort of knowledge base underneath me before writing about about the past in Natchez. Right. One of the things you bring out is kind of in the, in the slavery going into the, you know, post-slavery world was the, uh, the, the unusual, uh, nature of in, in Natchez where, um, you know, black relation relationships between, uh, you know, uh, mostly white men and black women, some, you know, and the resulting, uh, children that came out of those that, unlike a lot of other Southern communities, at least up until, I guess, into the 20th century, there was, you know, some open acknowledgement of these relationships and the, and the family connections. Yeah. And that's just was very, very unusual in that regard. Um, it was more like, it was, it was the only place other than New Orleans where, uh, you know, the children of, of relationships between white men and black women could, you know, the big, there was a big free black population it was Natchez was a place where a white man could live openly with a black woman 
um, without getting socially ostracized in the, in the same way that they would be elsewhere in the South. And then you also, if you look at the old families in Natchez, they're the, the old white and black families, like their, their bloodlines are thoroughly intermingled um, in a way that you don't, you don't really see outside Natchez and New Orleans, the same, the same tolerance for, um, yeah, for, for the children of, of mixed race relationships. And it seems like they, they, at least in the, I guess it's changing in the, in the white community in terms of the acknowledgement and, and kind of contemporary Natchez, but definitely many of the African Americans you spoke to could kind of point to their family, their, their familial connections to all these other, you know, these kind of grand old white families. Yeah, very much so. Um, yeah, I remember talking to the, the he's not, he's no longer the mayor, Daryl Grinnell, but, um, yeah, he um, he's related to I think two or three quite prominent white families, and he definitely thinks of them, you know, as his ancestors. And partly because the mixed race relationships were were kind of what he described as lasting, loving relationships. Um, but he was raised kind of all the way black, and um, his father was a civil rights activist, so he doesn't he doesn't think of himself as mixed race. He thinks of himself as a black man who has white ancestors that he is accepts, I guess would be one way of putting it. Mm -hmm. It's very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. But he seemed, it was very interesting. His, the complexity of his worldview on that and you could totally understand it, but it was, it was very interesting. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's not, he's not the only one I met, I met, I met several other African Americans with a sort of similar outlook. There was also, um, I don't think I actually wrote about this, but there was a there was this community in the woods not far outside Natchez that had, it, it was basically a, a, a kind of haven from the race system in Mississippi and in, in that people of all races lived openly in, I'm trying to remember the name of it, Freetown, something like that. But yeah, there was this little kind of um, isolated community where all the, all the, all the normal rules were suspended and I met some people whose uh, ancestors lived there. I should have put that in the book, shouldn't I? Yeah, that sounds like a good addition. Second, second edition, edition. Um, kind of along those, kind of connecting to those lines and kind of bringing it up into more of the contemporary era. You, you spent a chapter talking about the the late Natchez. Madam Nellie Jackson, that that a lot of people outside of uh, Natchez have heard about. Um, I think there was a documentary that was uh, film put together uh, in recent years. But t tell a little bit about her story. Yeah, there's actually a, a great documentary called uh, Mississippi Madam about her. I mean, to, one of the interesting things about Nellie Jackson is um, what she reveals about 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 Natchez as a community. It's much more it's much more tolerant and laissez-faire than the rest of Mississippi. Here's a town that uh, Nellie Jackson ran a brothel in the middle of Natchez, I think for 60 years. And she was friends with the chief of police. She was friends with the mayors and everyone just, just kind of let her get along with it. There was no talk of, of shutting Nellie down. Um, it's hard to think of another community in Mississippi that would do that. Um, yeah, she. Uh, I think she start, She started out. No one's quite clear. But she may have. She may have prostituted herself at the beginning. But anyway, yeah, she had this. Um, she had this house of house of sin about a block from where my friend Regina grew up, and Regina would go trick or treating at Nellie's house at Halloween, and Nellie would give her a roll of quarters, and. Uh, but on Sundays when they went to church, Regina's family would walk walk three ways around the block to avoid walking past Nellie's house on the way to church. So it was okay to trick or treat there, but not okay to walk past it on the way to church. <laughs> Nellie liked to dress well. She had she drove a white Cadillac, often with a white poodle, and she carried a pistol. And it came out what the documentary makers found out. Uh, which was not widely known, was that during the civil rights era, 
Nelly was a secret informant uh, for the FBI against the Ku Klux Klan. A lot of Klansmen were her customers, and apparently they they liked uh, black women in a kind of echo of slavery, I guess. What one of the perks of slavery was sexual access to black women for white men, and the Klansmen um, kind of perpetuated this tradition. They weren't interested in Nellie's white girls. But after sex, feeling, you know, feeling relaxed and confident, they would sometimes indulge in pillow talk with, uh, with Nellie's girls, as they were known. And some of this pillow talk, they would reveal secrets about clan activities. So about four in the morning, the FBI agents would show up at Nellie's place. Nellie would gather everything that she heard from her, quote, girls and then relay it to the FBI. And of course, if the Klan had ever found out that Nellie was an informer, they would have probably killed her and burned down her house. So she was a pretty remarkable woman. To, as, a, as a black woman in Mississippi in that era, to, to get away with that, um, I imagine required a great deal of skill. Mm-hmm, for sure. You're listening to the Arts Hour on MPB. I'm Larry Morrissey, and our guest today is Richard Grant, and we're talking about his new book, The Deepest South of All. Um, so Natchez is known for its um, as being a you know a, a hive of gossip, and a lot of people love to gossip there. They, I, I mean, I, I I've heard that you know you hear that when you go to visit. It's not something that they. It's a secret. It's pretty widely uh, um, kind of expressed. But so how do you as a kind of as someone who's kind of in a sense, reporting or you're, you're gathering information, how do you deal with such a kind of uh, highly tuned kind of gossip network when you're trying to put together, you know, write the facts down? Well, it's, it's really difficult, Larry. I had a, I had a hell of a time, um, you know, try, try not, trying to distinguish the embellishments and the, and the rumors from the, from the truth. Um, I mean, I've, a couple of times in the book, you will see that I used the phrasing "so and so told a story." Mm-hmm. I figure I figure that kind of got me off the hook a little bit. Here's somebody who's telling a story. I'm not telling. I'm not vouchsafing that it's a true story. I believe that it's a true story, but uh, you know, I I used that technique a couple of times, and you know, you 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 do the reporter thing. You try you you. You get people to repeat the story and you ask everybody else, like, was, was this the way it happened? But it's very difficult down there because they're great storytellers and embellishers. And, uh, yeah, it's sometimes very hard to get get to the truth of what actually happened. And I think I've since found out that some of the some of the stuff in my book was uh, was embellished and I didn't co- didn't catch it. But you were you kind of witnessed it firsthand. I think later in the book you talk about a, a scene where you you know uh, did some cooking for for a small group, and then kind of how it spinned out and how you heard yeah. back what exactly you were doing. I've forgotten that I put that in the book. Yeah. So what? So here's what really happened: is that um, I cooked. Ita- I cooked. A, I had a, I had a small dinner party at somebody else's house. I cooked Italian food. Uh, for four people, for Regina and her husband and another couple called Glenn and Bridget Green. And um, a few, you know, I just, you know, we had, a, we, had a, we had some Italian food and some Italian wine and a nice conversation. I thought that was the end of it. Then, then, I, then I learned through the Natchez rumor mill that I had thrown a dinner party for all the married gay men in town and I had served them Indian food and I'd then run off with Bridget for a dirty weekend on the coast. And this was coming from supposedly reputable sources that were talking to people that I knew in Natchez. So, yeah, it was quite something to see the, see the speed and power and, and creativity of the, of the Natchez gossip network. The detail of it being the Indian food and stuff, too, is just great. You know, like, yeah. no vagueness. Let's throw it all out there. And, you know, there are... There are uh, a lot of married gay men there. I mean, gay men married to women. And it was something that I had remarked to, remarked upon and somebody had sort of put it all together and, and, and switched the uh, ethnicity of the food that I cooked. And then just thrown in the detail of me having an affair with, with uh, Bridget. Why not? 
So what are your uh, so with the with the virus, things have changed a lot in terms of the the book promotion biz. What what kind of things have you got going on in terms? Are, are there kind of upcoming virtual events or other um, things that people might be able to uh, access remotely that are related to your to the book? Uh, not really. I don't I don't really have anything, to be honest. Uh, I did do a, a virtual event with Square Books and Lemuria Books where me and Greg Isles um, talked about Natchez. I think that's archived at, at uh, certainly at Lemuria's website, probably at Square Books' website too, but that's really been about it. Yeah, ordinarily I would be um, going to libraries all around Mississippi and meeting people. I was looking forward to that, you know. Maybe, maybe it'll just be postponed if we ever get this virus behind us. I, I think I will... Um, I will come to Mississippi, and even if the, even if my publishers won't set up a book tour, I think I I know enough, enough people and enough bookstores and libraries that I might just set up my own tour. Excellent, excellent, and I probably get a whole other book's worth of material just from the after after the events talking to people. Maybe so, maybe so. Wouldn't wouldn't rule out another book about Mississippi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app.